hi um what are we doing today today i am going to be vlogging um as we are closing out shorty september and my 30 books in 30 days we are having a gorgeous morning here uh in south carolina it is not humid it is crisp and beautiful and it's gonna be a perfect day for vlogging or maybe the next couple of days we don't know <laughs> are gathering up branches and sticks from our yard in the hopes of making a fire. I'm sure it's going to be like 80 something degrees today so we don't really need to build a fire but because it is a crisp morning they have it in their mind that building a fire would be plausible and practical. You know the minds of my children. <laughs> I came on here to actually talk about something else. I finished a book yesterday and it was Brokeback Mountain by Annie Prue. This, oh my goodness. Oh, y'all can hear hair in the background. This, I hope I don't get hit by any sticks. Uh, this was really good. It tells the story of either Eunice Mama or Aeneas. Hmm. I think it's Eunice probably Mama and Jack and their summer on Brokeback Mountain and their love story um, and really the the sad outcome of their love story. Now, I didn't know until I started booktube um, that this was a short story and I didn't know that it was by Annie Prue, the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist of The Shipping News. And I really love this. I thought her language, the language that she used in this, both to describe the Montana setting and the outdoors and the sort of ranch life was gorgeous, but also the way that she gave her characters accents and the way that they spoke to one another was really, really interesting and really good. Um, I could see where she shines in her writing and in her language, even with this tiny little thing. This is a short story, I believe, that was bound up in a single volume. I've seen these around. Um, I've seen copies of this book like at my Goodwill, and so, you know, they pop up. So I don't actually know if it was originally published in a single bind up or if it was a short story first and then it was eventually published as a single bind up. So I don't know. But anyways, regardless, a fantastic, fabulous, amazing, incredible read. And I loved it. Really, really loved it. Hey guys. So I'm sure you can actually hear my hot water starting to heat, my kettle starting to heat up. Um, it is nap time in the solar engine household. My boys are down for a nap. That means reading time for me. And I wanted to catch you all up on some of the reads that I've completed for my 30 books in 30 days slash shorty September. And yeah, but first I'm gonna make a cup of coffee. So perfect like little afternoon pick me up. Might make it a half decaf, just so that I'm not all wired this evening. <laughs> kids are napping, which is amazing. And I wanted to catch you up on some of the books that I have finished during this project. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is a historical fiction or biographical fiction read that came out this year and was long listed for the booker. And then it didn't get shortlisted, but the way that it was talked about with people on booktube, um, for example, Jennifer Brooks, called this book weird historical fiction like wolf hall and i was like oh girl that is like catnip to my little nose i just love weird historical fiction and it sounded like a read for me and then the read also worked for fraser simons at the channel springboard thought and so the book is booth by karen joy fowler 
Now Booth follows the Booth family and actually it's not about John Wilkes Booth, not really. It follows this family, the Booth family, that is they're Shakespearean actors. At least all of the men in the family or most of the men in the family take on this trade as being his like theatrical like taking the stage <laughs> during the 1800s in the U.S. and what it would be like to be in the limelight in the theatrical limelight during that time period and it really focuses in on this large family which is one of my favorite things. I come from a large family personally. I like to see it in literature. I love when an author can make a large family feel very dynamic and organic and how the relationships of the siblings and the parents play off of each other and each one of them is each dynamic and each relationship is unique and complicated in their own ways and I thought Karen Joy Fowler did an amazing job of that. I also was just tickled, like absolutely tickled by all of the Shakespeare references, the Shakespeare plays, the way that she really um, put it all together and it, it was just like delightful in a lot of ways. Um, so the book follows the three, three of John Wilkes Booth's siblings and their lives essentially and really John is in the background. Um, and it's only talked about in reference in reference to the siblings. So this book is really interesting because it focuses on the effects of alcohol abuse throughout the entire family and the way that a family can shape um, the way that uh, a family is organized um, when the central figure, the patriarch, has uh, some issues that they are not dealing with very healthily. It's also about extremism, and though extremism isn't necessarily at the heart of the novel, so in some ways it is, in some ways it's not, but it's a way, it's how the a, a family deals with and can see a person, a member in their family, kind of take a different path than the family values, and a path that is not good, a path that is detrimental to um, to the person and their health. But in a lot of ways, it was all about just being a big family and the awkward moments during this time period. It talks a lot about La Abraham Lincoln and as the aforementioned William Shakespeare. <laughs> and it talks just so much about like theater rivals and, you know, the way that people are reviewed. I mean, it was just so cool. And little did I know, I mean, I looked it up afterwards, but the Booth family really was a family of sh Shakespearean actors. So I actually think this is one of those times where I feel like a fiction book will lead me to some nonfiction because now I'm like, oh my gosh, I must know more about the Booth family. They just sound very eccentric. <laughs> And I love myself an, exc an eccentric family. So yeah, this was great. Um, I will say that it did drag in some spots. I do think it was overwritten by maybe 100 pages, maybe more. It was just a bit long. Um, and the climax came so far near the end that I thought that the aftermath would have been really interesting to explore. Uh, the effects of when somebody does something very damaging to the family and the way the family handles that and deals with that. But I felt like because the climax happened just so, so close to the end, Karen Wilkes Booth, I mean Karen Wilkes Booth, Karen Joy Fowler didn't give herself the opportunity, the page length to explore um, some of those themes um, or really the span of the aftermath of a traumatic event. But yeah, still a successful read for me. One book that was a little less successful um, came on the heels of, or I tried to read it on the heels of After Sappho, which was also a Booker uh, long-listed book by Selby Wynn Schwartz. Um, so I wanted to actually pick up Sappho Fragments. So I picked it up, if not Winter, um, and this is the Ann Carson translation of Sappho Fragments, who was a lyricist and a poet in the ancient in ancient Greece, um, and there is only, according to the introduction, there is only one full song, poem, that is complete out of Sappho's works, and the rest are fragments. So I have a major qualm with this book, and it's really the format. It's not her translation or anything. So at the end of this book, there are notes. 
So Anne Carson at the very beginning talks about how the brackets in the poetry means that there was words before it, but there, those words are missing. And so it indicates that she didn't put a line break in there, that those are missing words, missing pieces of the work. And then at the end, she there are these notes, the ones that I will probably be showing you right now, about um, how she translated, how she went about translating the words. The thing is, is that within the poetry, there is no footnotes to indicate that there is a note about the translation. Essentially, the reader's experience would be this. Um, one would read the introduction, which talks about Sappho and a little bit about how Anne Carson went about translating very loosely though. And then one would read all the fra Sappho fragments. And then at the very end, you would get detailed notes about Anne Carson's process and why she chose to translate the words in the way that she did. And she very much focuses in on little phrases and why she chose to translate those phrases in in that way and the thing is is like there's no indication in the poetry that those notes are corresponding to the that those words there's no footnotes there's no asterisks there's nothing like that um and I didn't like that because that means that and it I don't know which words have a note attached to them and I don't, as I'm reading, I would have loved to read her notes as I was going, but it's not all lined up perfectly. It's very, it just, it's very counterintuitive to a reader like me. My hunch is that the publisher wanted clean pages. So on on one page, um, on the left hand page, you have the Greek and on the right hand page, you have the translation. And there aren't any footnotes, there isn't any of the one above the number to indicate that there is a note attached to it. Um, because it that would clutter the text. And then there's no, um, you know, little footnote area that has all of her writings in it to talk about her approach. But I think it's because that would have cluttered up the look of the book. And for me, I would rather have a more practical and useful uh, book uh, rather than an aesthetic one because it took me a really really long time to get into the poetry um, to understand what she was doing to understand her translation style and really kind of get into a rhythm with it which was sort of surprising for me because um, almost everything Greek that I've read thus far or in the last couple of years have just been um, just gorgeous so it just took a while and I ended up getting some foot footnotes so here's some of the things you'll get as the sweet apple reddens on a high branch, high on the highest branch, and the apple pickers forgot. No, not forgot, were unable to reach. Here's another one. But I am not someone who likes to wound, rather I have a quiet mind. So it, it's beautiful, um, it's fragmented, so you're not getting a whole satisfactory poem or even story or even through line thought, but there is a lot about love and festivities and beauty and little observations on life. And I am just so sad that these are uh, fragments and not whole pieces, which is not anyone's fault. I mean, just the fault of time, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so this was like a semi-successful successful read for me. I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I was able to get to it um, to better understand the book after Sappho. Um, but ultimately, I think I will seek out or probably recommend not picking up this book um, and, and picking up one that was perhaps better translated or better formatted, to be honest. Tuesday, and I, fig I figured I would sort of finish this vlog up by telling you the last, the dregs of the books that I have missed up until now. It is the 27th and I have, I've read 27 books and I still haven't talked about all of them. <laughs> so I figured to finish out this vlog, I'd actually do it in the, in the space, in the sort of Shelly space and get ready and it'd be kind of casual. You're going to hear sounds in the background because my younger son, Didi, is playing games and so we're just going with it. 
You'll hear Harry. I mean, nothing really new or different. I mean, sometimes I'll kind of quiet D down or if he's playing games on the iPad, I'll be like, look, you need to put on headphones. But today I'm just like, you know what? We're doing this casual. And I really do have to get ready for going out because I have a meeting, the ominous nondescript meeting <laughs> to go to in um, about, I don't know, I have to leave in about 45 minutes. So I have plenty of time, but you know, just saying. Gracious me. Okay, so one book that I keep on forgetting to talk to you all about is, and I was going to put it in the video about books I have been reading that are outside of my comfort zone, and then I forgot because it was the second book that I finished, and I just haven't thought about it <laughs> like too much. I mean, it's not, it's not the fault of the story. Um, it's more of like, I've just been reading so much and I didn't talk about it right away. So I just have been kind of snubbing it in regards to talking about it. But anyways, it's An Elderly Lady is Up to No Good by Helene Kirsten, translated from the Swedish into English uh, by Melaine Delargi. Um, and this is a murder mystery, which is not necessarily my comfort zone. It's not necessarily the thing that I um, gravitate towards, but it was really cute. Um, it was made up of short stories, and the first couple of stories worked in the same way. Um, and the elderly lady, she uses her elderliness <laughs> to kind of get away with murder, literally. Um, it's funny, it's not, it's not about like it being too deep. The, the characters are flat and it's more about the plot <laughs> and the sort of outrageousness of the story. And in that way, it makes it charming and funny and entertaining. But anyways, this, the short stories work in a very similar way. And then as soon as I kind of figured out the formula, the stories changed. It, they were, there was a little change up. And I really liked that. I was like, huh. Because at, at one point I was like, are all these stories going to work in the exact same way? But they don't. And that was a nice surprise. And it was charming. It was short. It was funny. It was about murder, which is not something I normally read. And I liked it. I definitely liked it. Alright, so let's stick with the translated novel theme. I finally read Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Mur Murata. Sayaka Murata, I believe it's her name, and it was translated by uh, Jenny Tapley Takamori. So <laughs> this was great. This, okay, I, I shouldn't just start off with like me, my feelings about it. So this tells the story of a, let's see, what is her name? That's right. Okay. So this tells the story of Kiko and she is a little bit different. She, she approaches the world a little bit differently. I think that we would consider her neurodivergent at this point, but it never says it or states it in the book anywhere, but clearly there is some neurological differences for Kiko. And so what she does is that she has had this part-time job at a convenience store for years. And there are other people in her life, um, friends, family members, that just want her to be normal and she ends up trying to take the normal path and that is where the conflict arises for her um and, and it was really interesting i really enjoyed the character of kiko i thought she was incredibly charming and very very sweet and i thought it said a lot about routines and simple routines and the things that we have in our life to make us feel stable even if we aren't neurodivergent or if we don't identify with necessarily Kiko but I think that there is so much to say for stability in our lives even if other people don't understand it um, and I, I just really really liked that um, I thought this was just so well done. It didn't overstay its welcome. It was charming and sweet and funny at points. And I loved spending time with the main character. There was just, I just, I almost can't like I explain why. She was just cute and funny. <laughs> um, I also love that this is set in Japan and I have been to Japan. I am a part, I'm quarter Japanese. Um, so some of the cultural references just felt very homey to me. Um, and yeah, so I just, I just really enjoyed that, but yeah, so very successful. 
really just slapping on the makeup here today. <laughs> Not being very precise at all. <sighs> Maybe I should slow it down a little bit. I've been really loving sparkly glitter for my eyes and so I have this sparkly glitter. It's literally putting a shine in my life. Um, <laughs> so, so I want to use this but I don't know what to match it with and I don't want a like super intense eye look. So we'll see what I do. Let's... Um, yeah, I think I'll just do something really light and kind of just glimmery and shimmery. So let's get that done. So another book that I read was Deborah Levy's The Man Who Saw Everything, which is about a very self-centered main character named Saul Bellow. And it starts off with him getting hit by a car on his bicycle as he is about to meet his girlfriend for a photo shoot to do the classic Beatles photo shoot. <laughs> I can't remember, like, I'll, I'll show you. Um, it's, it's there, I'll pop it in somewhere. Um, and they're going to recreate that. And, oh gracious, I think it's getting too loud. There's a point where it's just like, it's, it's a little bit too much, y'all. All right, so Saul Bellow is a historian and it is set in 1988. I don't even know where I left off. I think I was talking about taking a photograph and where it started. But anyway, so it takes place in 1988 and he, the main character, ends up... So the whole, I guess the, th the thrust of the book, the intrigue of the book is that you kind of don't know what's happening and there is a bit of like a magical realistic feel to it. Um, it's also the time period is really fascinating. So it's in 1988, part of the story takes place in London and the other part of the story takes place in East uh, Berlin. And the whole like what politically what's going on in East Berlin is is fascinating and especially since we're getting kind of like a ground look at it not an not an overview we're following characters and their daily lives during the like paranoia and the um constraints of living in East Berlin at the time especially as Politically, it's just no one really trusts each other. People are being followed. Um, it's very hard to get visas. It's very hard to leave East Berlin and East Germany at, the t at that time. And that was really fascinating to me. And then the story ends up taking a t in true chaotic Shelley fashion. My card was full, my memory card. So yay, um, <laughs> love that. But I was just going on about how Okay, so the man who saw everything, the things that worked for it was the time period and the character and some of the relationships that the character um, got himself into and the way that was explored. What didn't work for me was like the second half and the twist to everything. I didn't like that very much. All right, to finish off this very chaotic vlog, <laughs> I don't even know how it's gonna turn out. It's okay, it's okay. Um, to finish off the vlog, I'm gonna tell you all about one of the most successful reads to come out of this 30 books in 30 days so far. What, bub? What was I saying? Okay, so the one of the, my favorite things that have come, that has come out of this 30 books in 30 days is that it has motivated me to finish the graphic comic series, the graphic novel series. I read it on my iPad though. Um, Heartstopper. So I polished off the whole series and it is essentially um, a love story between two uh, two young men in high school and navigating what that is and what it means and um, and falling in love and <laughs> your friends and what your friends might think of you and sort of the, the drama that comes from a high school relationship. But it wasn't too dramatic um and it also wasn't too sweet and it wasn't too romantic and it definitely tackles some more difficult topics as well as having a lot of like comic relief and sweet moments um to relieve the tension in the book um or in the whole series and yeah i just really loved it i just thought it was such it was one of those things it was one of those worlds oh i didn't even say who it was by it's by alice osmond i'm sure i'm pu putting up a some sort of photo up but anyways, uh, what I loved about it was she created a world 
that I think she really loved. Like she just had these little appendix in the back where she drew the rooms of the main characters. She didn't need to do that. I think she did it because she wanted to do it. Um, and it was like she fell in love with her own world and thus I fell in love with the world as well. And it was a world that I really didn't want to leave. Um, and that was the last time I felt that way, which wasn't that long ago, was the Alana Ferrante books in which I finished the first book, My Brilliant Friend, and immediately had to find out what happened, and I'm still regretting putting that series on pause. So, yeah. Oh gosh, I just got mascara on myself. Let me fix this. Children's games have the worst sound effects. It's just, oh, the worst. Anyhow, I loved Heartstopper so much, so, so much, that I was dying to know when, not actually dying, but you know, I was just on pins and needles wondering if, well, when the next installment would come out. And the next installment is going to come out in February of 2023, and it's going to be the last installment of the series, and I cannot wait. I really cannot wait. It's going to be, I hope it's amazing. I mean, the, sh the whole ride has been amazing so far, so even if the last book is a letdown, I would, I'm not going to be disappointed in going on this journey. And yeah, I'm just so glad to have finished it, y'all. I'm so glad. Okay, got to focus because, you know, eyebrows. I don't know why I said that. I think it's because I hear it all the time on beauty YouTube. The uh, beauty, the, the, you know, the beauty creator is always like, oh, I have my eyebrows. I gotta, I gotta focus. And then it's like, they're doing this delicate miniature portrait on their face in order, in the eyebrow area in order to get them like just so. For me, I just follow the shape of my eyebrows. Um, I'm sure it doesn't look amazing, but it works for me. Um, and it doesn't really take a lot of concentration because I do the same thing every time. I, I say it doesn't take a lot of concentration and then I go silent. So I will end this here. Um, I will say, what have you been reading? <laughs> I am currently reading, it's like I got caught up on my challenge um, and I got a little bit ahead on my challenge. So then what happened was is that I went back to, I reverted back to my normal state of reading where I read four books at one time. And then all of a sudden I'm not, I'm gonna catch myself up again. Like I'm going to, the days are gonna catch up with me. So all of that work to get ahead and to make sure that I stay ahead and that I complete the challenge. It's like, I, I got there. And then I was like, hooray, I'm gonna start four relatively long books. And I feel like I'm gonna get behind again, but that's all right. That's all right. I feel like 27 books in 27 days. Well, it was 27 books in 25 days was pretty, pretty darn good. And so I'm not going to put a ton of pressure on myself, though I really would like to finish the 30, the 30 books. Um, but yeah, that's it. So <laughs> tell me, what have you been reading? Um, has it been as chaotic as, as my reads, you know, as all over the place as my reads? I would love to know that. Um, and you know, if it's great, I want to know what, what's great that you've been reading. If it's terrible, let me know so I can avoid it. <laughs> Unless we have opposite tastes, like me and Scott from Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. Um, when he says a book is horrible, I'm like, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love that book. <laughs> Though we've been finding a lot of common ground lately. I'm gonna go because at this point I'm just rambling. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. And I will see you all in my next one. Bye guys.